CloudDB, shaping your new normal. Hello and welcome to this session on Exadata Architecture and Internals Deep Dive. My name is Alex Blythe. I'm a Senior Principal Product Manager uh, with the Oracle Exadata Development Organization. I'm based in Sydney, Australia, uh, as opposed to in uh, San Francisco, but uh, work very closely with the development organization out of, uh, out of the US on all things to do with the Oracle Exadata platform. Uh, before I jump into the content, a uh, lot of ways of contacting me here, uh, Carrier Pigeon probably being the one that's not, uh, not immediately available to, uh, to all of us, but in any case, you can uh, tweet at myself or at uh, Gavin Parrish and myself uh, at either of the Twitter handles on the screen at the moment, uh, or you can get in contact with me uh, via LinkedIn. Um, please reach out, uh, always uh, very keen to hear from uh, users and customers to understand their experiences better uh, on the Exadata platform and uh, see how we can make things uh, or improve things as we go over time. Um, please also keep an eye on blogsoracle.com slash Exadata. Uh, we're doing a lot of work to try to bring more and more information and collateral and uh, helpful tidbits of information to, uh, to that site. Um, so please keep an eye on that. So today we're going to talk about uh, Exadata architecture and internals. And we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive on some of the, uh, the newer technologies that have been introduced in the Exadata platform uh, over the last few years. But before we jump into how those new technologies work, let's just kind of remind ourselves a little bit about uh, why Exadata is the platform that it is, what the intention of the platform uh, was when it was brought into, uh, into uh, reality uh, about 12 to 15 years ago now. So let's just all cast our minds back for a second uh, and think about some, uh, some outdated or legacy technologies as we've got in the slide here. Um, if anyone remembers going to libraries, I, mean, I you know, still enjoy very much going to the library, but if you think back 20 years ago, uh, libraries often were very uh, you know, single-threaded. There weren't very many copies of most books, if any copies of most books. You know, one was the number of uh, of copies you tend to have, you used to have to put your name on a waiting list. And at some point after, you know, 20, 30, 40 people had gotten to that data, or gotten to that book rather, you would get your turn. You'd be now at the front of the line. So what tends to happen in libraries and in older technology or older platforms, uh, architecture platforms for databases, is you tend to do a lot of waiting, waiting for resources, a book being a resource in this case. What also happens if you think about a different, uh, you know, somewhat legacy technology um, is you might be looking for one piece of information. Uh, I'm not particularly big on sport, but let's use sport as a metaphor in this particular case. Newspaper on the back page of most newspapers is the sports report. You tend to get local football, baseball, cricket, whatever the, uh, you know, tennis, whatever the kind of sport that you're interested in tends to be on those back pages, back half a dozen pages of, of most newspapers. And if that's all you want, you've gone and picked up a newspaper or had it delivered, hopefully, um, and it's got all this superfluous information, got all of this you know, really interesting and useful information, but you're not interested in it to satisfy your query around who, you know, who won the tennis last night or who, you know, who won the cricket last night. Uh, so you tend to get all this information delivered to you that you're not expecting. Again, this is how traditional database platforms also work. The other thing, to think about is throughput. Now, again, thinking back to a, a somewhat dated uh, analogy, bank tellers going into a branch of a bank, oftentimes you had to wait in line, you know, usually at lunchtime, because that's when most of us can get to, uh, can get to the bank. You have to wait in line as uh, a large number of people all tried to use a very small number of resources being the bank teller themselves. So you'd have to wait in, uh, in line, get to the front of the queue, uh, and then you could do your transaction, whatever that happened to be. And depending on how the bank was being managed, maybe you'd have more tellers, maybe you'd have less. Sometimes they go on lunch break at the same time there's a massive queue. So, you know, you have this crunch for resources, uh, you know, always taking place um, that is being managed in a way that you don't quite understand. So throughput becomes affected because of that. And if you bring all of that to bear on traditional database server architectures. And this is, you know, big monolithic database servers with some sort of storage attached network. These same paradigms apply to that technology as well. Um, having all of these different, 
I guess, competing challenges, you know, lots of waiting, delivering unnecessary or unneeded information back to the database server, uh, potentially challenges with throughput. All of these are common in traditional database server architectures. So what's a modern database architecture, so a server architecture rather? Well, a modern database server architecture is one where the application is resident on more than just the database server itself. So bringing intelligence to the storage server. And that's what Exadata brings to the table. And hopefully everyone on this call is somewhat familiar with that architecture um, uh, right off the bat. But if you think about the way that databases work, they're processing data. And they are typically on some very uh, modern technology, modern hardware. They have access to a lot of uh, a lot of resources, but if the storage does not know the application that it's doing work for, being an, an Oracle database in this instance, then you've got, as the phrase goes, you've got Buckley's of knowing exactly what data or how to best um, process that data and to send it back to the database. Uh, you have to send all of it back and get the database server to do that work for you. So the Exadata architecture is all about moving uh, the work to the data, not moving the data to the work, as is the case in traditional, um, in traditional uh, architectures. And what this does is, is allows Oracle to make truly uh, scalable platforms that allow high levels of automation and autonomy, as we'll talk about a little later on down the track, but ultimately allow a lot more work to be done uh, more sensibly, you know, smartly, intelligently, uh, and allow you know, people like Bob here uh, in his Twitter post to, you know, to, to you know, make these kind of claims where uh, you know, he gets a longer lunch break and people think he's smarter than maybe he is, although I know Bob is particularly smart, um, because they are using a platform that intelligently manages data for them, not one on the right-hand side here, who we won't name names, you know, has seen database servers taken down in production, production database servers taken down because someone has written a query that has no where clause, no predicates. It's returning entire tables back to the database server and the database server has got to hope to, you know, somehow work out what to do with all of that information. Whereas on the left-hand side, Exadata is doing a lot of work to, you know, to prune information out, to avoid doing work, uh, in fact, uh, so that, uh, these queries get returned very quickly. And we'll dig into a little of this as we go along. Now, just to remind uh, everyone around Exadata's vision, um, really we have three, uh, three key points or three key uh, you know, guiding principles uh, around Exadata and, and, and why it was built the way it was, but also what drives us you know, moving forward as well. So it really boils down to these three statements, provide the ideal database hardware environment, create database aware system software that supports and complements the hardware and the Oracle database itself and automate as much as possible. Those are the three driving forces behind, uh, behind Exadata. Now, along with all of that comes an endless uh, pursuit of performance. And we'll talk about that uh, in just a couple of minutes, but that you know, boils down into that ideal database hardware and that system uh, software and that automated management all coming together allows us to provide a platform that is truly powerful and can handle any workload that you happen to, uh, to throw at it. Because it is our strategic platform for database management, for Oracle database management, it's also available and it is being used uh, significantly in all of our cloud offerings. So on-premises, uh, as most people are probably already aware of Oracle Exadata, uh, but also in our cloud at customer offering and our Oracle public cloud, both in terms of our Exadata cloud service, but also our autonomous offerings. So this is dedicated and the, the, the shared platforms. What many people don't realize though, is that Exadata is also the driving force behind our SaaS applications. So all of our uh, Fusion SaaS applications, all of our public offerings uh, that use um, uh, the, the customers use are all being driven by an Oracle Exadata underneath the covers as well. So you get the benefit of this enormous fleet of Exadata being managed by Oracle in your data center as a cloud offering in your data center or as a true public cloud offering, regardless of how you want to consume that, you get that, uh, that uh, community effect just from Oracle, let alone from uh, adding that out to the rest of uh, the user community. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, intelligent storage. 
So I mentioned before that newspaper analogy where we're bringing back lots of superfluous information. So database blocks you know, typically have lots of information in them, around 8K worth of information. But depending on the query that you're throwing at the database server, a lot of that information, a lot of that data is actually unrequired. It's unnecessary to satisfy the query that you've thrown at the database at that point in time. And I, I say here facetiously, you know, it clogs up the network. It doesn't, it's just in a traditional architecture, that whole 8K block has to be sent across the wire for the database server to then decide what to do with the majority of the information in that block. So it's not clogging it up. It's just, it's not using the network uh, intelligently. It's passing information across, it's never gonna get used. So if you think about a very simple query, uh, and my apologies for using a, a US centric uh, analogy, but uh, it's what I've been working with, so we'll go with it. If I wanna find all the names of addresses of customers in California, in a traditional architecture, I am passing potentially huge amounts of data covering all 50 states of the US because all of this data is gonna be intermingled in the same blocks, just to then discard a huge proportion of that data looking for customers in California. So what we want to do and what we do in Exadata is we tell the database storage, we are looking for two columns, name and address. We're, so we're telling the, the storage server what to project from those blocks and give us a, a virtual uh, view of the information coming out. So I'm gonna limit what I'm returning from the storage server to the database server just to the name and address. And then I'm gonna ask the storage server also to do the filtering for me. Instead of sending that whole 8K block back with all of the extra columns and extra rows that I really don't need, I'm gonna ask the storage server to say, just give me rows that are associated with California. So where uh, state equals CA. So I'm projecting the columns back, just the ones I want, and I'm filtering out all of the unnecessary, unneeded information and returning just name and address for customers in California. And that's the unique difference between Exadata and traditional database architectures, where I'm asking the storage to do the bulk of the heavy lifting. And if you think through that, uh, that process further, if I am reducing the amount of information from any given block down to a small sub, you know, a, a small fraction of that 8K that typically gets sent across, well, I'm no longer clogging up the network in inverted commas as I'm passing the information back, I'm intelligently using that network by only sending information back to the database servers that are gonna be used. So I'm streamlining and better utilizing not just the storage resources, but also the network resources and allowing the database server to do less work because I've done a huge amount of that work on the storage server to start off with. And as you can see in the graphic there, what I'm trying to indicate is the database software runs in the database server as you'd expect but we're also running portions of that database code down the storage server so that we can do this projection and filtering operation and many, many others as well. The other thing to think about is modern technologies, Flash being the, uh, the key example here. So in traditional database, store, uh, database architectures where you have a SAN, you might have an all Flash array or you might have an array that has some you know, Flash in front of a of hard drive or in cloud, uh, based architectures as well. The shared capacity of those devices is very easily realized. Having a very large amount of flash devices gives you a large amount of very fast storage, either as a cache in front of storage or as a you know, primary, uh, primary storage mechanism. The challenge with these kind of technologies is they become very rapidly bound by the network. As you can see in the graphic there, that one flash device, that one flash card, can send 5.8 gigabytes per second, um, uh, sorry, has a bandwidth of 5.8 gigabytes per second. Whereas the network link, and this happens to be an InfiniBand uh, NIC there, is only capable of sending five, gigabit, uh, five gigabytes per second across the wire. So immediately, if I've got a single flash card, I am saturating or potentially saturating the network. And if I scale that out to uh, a typical uh, stand or, or, or all flash array, I don't have one card. I've got dozens, if not hundreds, but I still have very small, in comparison, a small network bandwidth that's able to process that information. So the benefits of flash are very rapidly lost, almost immediately lost, in fact, by having this mismatch in uh, performance 
and bandwidth of the flashcards versus the bandwidth of the network itself. So again, getting the database to tell the storage servers to do more work locally, and that means inside the storage tier itself, means that we get the full benefit of that flash array or that those flash cards in the Exadata storage servers so that when we're sending that information back across the network, we are just sending what's required. So we get that full bandwidth of the flash uh, by doing, uh, doing those operations locally. The other thing we can do is in, in Exadata's architecture is make not just full use of flash as we've just uh, discussed briefly, briefly, but also take advantage of emerging technologies or new technologies like persistent memory. Um, and remote direct memory access is not a new technology, but it's one that we're, we're increasingly uh, building in optimizations and, uh, and uh, updates into the database so that we can reduce the amount of latency or the amount of time it takes to uh, access one server from another server to get memory or to move data rather from one uh, memory buffer in a, in a server to another server entirely. Uh, and a few other features that we'll talk about as we go along. So taking full advantage of this modern hardware technology is really difficult though, if you don't build the architecture and the software that runs on that to leverage the entire hardware stack and understand the workload that's gonna be running on it at any given time. So just to give a really brief uh, reminder of the Exadata platform, comprised of three key components. Uh, Oracle database servers, Oracle uh, servers. Uh, we're now running 32 core Intel Ice Lake CPUs. We're now able to ship up to two terabytes of memory from the factory. It's a, a, a choice you have at, um, at purchase time. Um, you can uh, you know, have half a terabyte, one terabyte or two terabytes from the factory. This is also all field upgradable as well. For really uh, truly large workloads, there is an eight socket variant as well. Um, all of uh, all Exadata's X8M and X9M are bound together using an RDMA over converged ethernet fabric. So this is that internal wiring on that backplane wiring that connect all of the database servers to every other database server, but also to every storage server. And the storage servers uh, have been revved up to the latest 16 core Ice Lake, uh, Intel Ice Lake CPUs as well. We've increased the amount of memory in the storage servers in this generation up to 256 uh, gig of memory. And we'll talk about uh, some interesting features in the storage uh, tier a little later on uh, to do with memory. Um, and we've also included the series 200 1.5 terabyte persistent memory um, in, the, uh, in the X9M variant as well. When you start building this platform out though, you can start as small as uh, an eighth rack and a quarter rack. So two database servers and three uh, storage servers and scale out to you know, a full rack. And this is just an example of uh, the current generation's capacity within a single rack of equipment. You can then multi-rack these machines together as well, up to 12, um, and get a truly, you know, uh, you know, fit for purpose for any size workload platform. And anywhere in between that, uh, you're able to obviously work out where you, uh, where you might need to fit in that regard. So just bear that in mind, it's, input, you know, it's, it's interesting and, and useful to know the components that we're working with and remember that they are all modular. I can add database servers, I can add storage servers, I can do these independently of each other. I don't have to work in fixed, uh, you know, fixed blocks or fixed chunks of, uh, of compute and storage or have to do them both at the same time. If you've used Exadata in the past, prior to X8M, you'd be familiar with the term InfiniBand. I mentioned InfiniBand a few slides ago. Uh, this was the original technology that uh, network technology that Exadata relied on. And it was the binding uh, fabric between those database servers and storage servers. In traditional architectures, where you are building that platform yourself, where you are bringing together uh, storage, you're bringing together servers, you're trying to work out what network fabric to use, you know, do I use uh, Ethernet, do I use, um, uh, you know, some sort of other fabric, uh, fiber channel, you know, those kind of things. You have to do all of that heavy lifting of bringing them together, doing the testing, making sure it all works, doing some, you know, doing tuning on an ongoing basis to get some level of performance you're happy with. But what happens if you need to change a technology? What if you outgrow as you know, we are 
you know, saying here, we outgrew InfiniBand. What happens when you need to go through that whole exercise all over again? With engineered systems, with Exadata specifically, because we are constantly looking at what emerging technologies are coming down the path, we're able to look at what meets our needs today and into the you know, short, medium and long term, as well as what emerging technologies are going to support us in the medium to long term and plan for those events, those change of events and do significant amount of testing, much more than most organizations would be able to do themselves. So that when the time, the, the time comes to change from, in this case, InfiniBand to that RDMA over converged ethernet network fabric, not only do we just get you know, a sheer speed up in throughput, you know, two and a half times faster you know, from uh, InfiniBand um, you know, 40 gigabits to 100 gigabits, that's fine. But it's all of that ancillary work to make sure that not just the hardware architecture works together, but the software does as well. I mentioned right at the top of the call that Exadata relies on technologies like RDMA and RDS to do a lot of the work or to do a significant majority of the work that allows us to make the claims that we make in terms of performance and stability and, uh, and availability and so forth. If you were changing technologies like InfiniBand, which is capable of RDMA, and you were relying on those features for performance, for stability, for availability, and you had to, because you'd outgrown the bandwidth of that particular fabric, change to a different network fabric, converged ethernet in this particular case. If you can't control the R part of that, the RDMA over, you've got no chance of being able to make that switch seamlessly. And really what this slide is boiling down to is, we do all of that work for you because we are continually architecting and looking into the future to see what technologies are going to support the largest of workloads, the most rigorous of workloads that, uh, you know, that can be run on the planet um, and allow that to happen seamlessly without applications having to be rewritten, without having to you know, go through huge amounts of testing at customer sites. We've done that work for you. We control that entire stack so we can do that work for you. Along with features like RDMA, uh, and that uh, RDMA of converged ethernet network fabric. We're also thinking about, again, how do we best use that, that fabric? How do we make sure that we are prioritizing messages that are going on the server, sorry, going onto the network from the servers to ensure that uh, latency critical um, requests or network messages like log rights, for instance, like cache, uh, cache fusion um, messages, uh, transaction commits, how do we make sure these type of operations are done with the highest priority and not overwhelmed by very high throughput uh, uh, workloads, backup reporting batch, those kind of uh, those things. If you're not using, if you're, if you're not capable of architecting the platform and having the application use the entire platform's capabilities, you are really at the mercy of the hardware platform itself as to whether your low latency or latency critical messages get through or get or do they get overwhelmed by uh, high throughput. So another good example of the way the architecture works or supports database workloads is we built into the platform the uh, all of the, uh, the the classification of different types of messages that go inside an Oracle Rack database to ensure that the class of service uh, rules that are uh, available inside the network switches uh, can be adhered to and make sure that again, you know, things like cluster heartbeats, cache fusion messages, uh, transaction, uh, you know, log rights, uh, you know, all are not overwhelmed uh, or, and aren't competing for uh, resources, network resources, uh, at the same time that, you know, uh, big hairy workloads like batch and reporting and, and backups are going on at the same time. Another feature of this RDMA over converged ethernet network fabric is the ability for Exadata to instantaneously detect failure. One of uh, you know, the, the key challenges with any clustered environment is uh, detecting and evicting sick nodes, whether that's a storage node in our particular, in, in our case, or whether it's a database server, uh, you know, a, a machine that is unhealthy 
tends to have uh, a detrimental effect on the entire cluster. Lots of work goes into working out why it's sick, how to resolve it. Um, you know, it tends to chew up a lot of time and resources. So Exadata using RDMA is constantly doing heartbeats between database servers and storage nodes. And if a server is detected to be unhealthy, and by that I mean, uh, if all four RDMA pings of a server fail coming from, uh, from its partner machines, that node, whether it's storage, whether it's database server, is evicted from the cluster so that it can be reintroduced gracefully and go through whatever recovery mechanisms that need to be gone through. Whether that's automated as part of the way the database and Exadata software is, uh, is written, or whether that's something, you know, manual, uh, some sort of manual intervention because of, you know, maybe a, uh, I don't know, a, uh, a poorly installed uh, third party package uh, or a, uh, you know, a module that shouldn't have been in, uh, injected into the platform in the first place um, to support a third party module. You know, they can be then manually rectified and brought back into the environment. Um, but that, that rapid, that instantaneous detection of a sick node and eviction of it is crucially important to maintain stability and to maintain performance. And as you can see here, you know, for a, uh, a um, in comparison to non-exadata platforms, that time to detect and resolve a sick node goes from, you know, a, a, a 60 second CSS miscount, so this being the, uh, you know, the, the database default for uh, waiting for a response from a, uh, from a server before being evicted, down to, uh, you know, less than a second because we are using RDMA to check the health of, uh, of any server and see whether it should be evicted or not. I mentioned persistent memory uh, very early on in the piece, uh, but really didn't talk very much about it. So let's talk about persistent memory for a minute and what this new technology does, because it's a very important uh, addition to the Exadata architecture at the end of the day. So persistent memory, it's a new technology. Um, you know, it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's commercialized. It's being, you know, it's getting more and more traction. Uh, the latest version of Oracle Database natively supports persistent memory as well. Um, but it's a new technology that is exactly what it says on the tin. It's memory that's persistent. Meaning that if you write to it and then the power is turned off to that memory dim, whether that's, you know, the motherboard fails, uh, whether the storage is, uh, sorry, the, uh, the server is, uh, is restarted, you know, the whole data center loses power, whatever has been written to that memory dim is persisted and available on startup. So it's exactly as it says on the tin, like I said a minute ago, memory that is persistent. Now, the, the interesting thing about memory is that typically it's put inside database servers. And in Exadata, we're always looking for um, the most optimal location for any given piece of hardware. And for persistent memory, the best place for us to put a resource like persistent memory where it can be shared uh, and pulled for no, a, a number of workloads, you know, multiple databases in a cluster or multiple database virtual machines, uh, you know, on a set of infrastructure was to put that inside the storage tier rather than have it localized inside the database servers where potentially it gets, uh, it gets um, locked away in a siloed sort of fashion uh, as is often the case of more traditional architectures. Now, persistent memory runs at memory speed, which is much faster than flash. And like I said, it survives uh, power failure or power outage, um, unlike DRAM. So for us to make the most use of it, as I said, we put that inside the storage here, and that allows us to build an automated tiering mechanism from disk to flash to persistent memory. And then using DRAM, uh, as you'd expect, because operating systems all need DRAM, uh, processes all need uh, you know, DRAM as well. But it allows us to make the, the, the most of all of these different technologies um, at the same time as servicing the most demanding workloads. So let's dissect a little bit of IO latency inside uh, inside Exadata, just so that we can see how persistent memory benefits the architecture. This is Exadata before 
persistent memory. And this was already an incredibly fast proposition. And our, as I said earlier on, our relentless pursuit of performance means that we're always looking for ways of improving that. So to, uh, in previous generations of Xdata without persistent memory, what you would need to do uh, when you were running, uh, when you were requesting IO is the database server would have to uh, ask the kernel and the operating system on that server, so the database is doing this work, to say, I would like some, uh, I'd like a block of information, please, from the storage server. It would then traverse the network, and go to the kernel and operating system on the storage server, say, hey, I've got a request coming in, pass this to the storage server software, please, to go and find some sort of IO. Now, that first trip there can take you know, tens of microseconds in both of those different database sections. The network, um, the network speed is, um, you know, is relatively neg negligible there, but all that context switching in the database software, the operating system, the, uh, the operating system, the storage server into the storage server software takes tens of microseconds. And then we get a hundred microsecond read from flash. All right, so we're up to somewhere north of 120, let's call it 140, maybe 150 microseconds to get that read done at the storage server tier. And then that block has to traverse that same path back to the database server where it can be processed. So now I've got to go back through storage server software, back to the kernel, uh, across the wire, back to the database server's kernel, into the database software, and there it gets processed. The long and short of it is that, uh, that read of flash takes somewhere in the order of around 200 microseconds without persistent memory. So let's just break that down a little bit and look at it a slightly different way. We'll start by uh, sending that read from the database server. So we're sending a disk, uh, a disk ID and, a, and an offset from the database server across the wire to the storage server. That storage server then looks up that disk and offset, uh, finds out it's a location on flash, specifically a thing called the flash cache line. Um, it will go and then do that read and then return that back. So this is a conventional two-sided read on Exadata without persistent memory. So just keep this architecturally or this flow chart, I guess, in mind for a moment. Now, if we were to just place persistent memory into the database servers and do nothing, sorry, into the storage servers and do nothing else, the database would still have to send that request from the database server itself through the database server kernel and OS and networking stack across the wire down to the storage server into storage server software to then ask the storage server to do a read from persistent memory. So now I've got, I've got my data cached in persistent memory instead of in flash, well, it's cached there as well. My read drops from around 100 microseconds to around one microsecond. So I've shaved 99, let's call it 99% of my, uh, my read latency off just by putting uh, persistent memory in. And then I pass that information back across that same path back to the database server. And we could have gone, you know, we've just, you know, we've just halved the latency for uh, read IO, job done, and walked away. But those three key visionary statements for Exadata compel us to continually look for ways of improving performance. And this is one of those key areas that we said we can do better. And I've mentioned the, the, uh, the phrase RDMA multiple times, remote direct memory access. RDMA is built into the database software. It's part of the network cards. It's supported on that RDMA over converged ethernet fabric. And it allows us, and this is the key reason why we're putting the, the persistent memory inside the storage servers. It allows the database software to directly read memory from a storage server avoiding all that context switching that was on the right-hand side. I don't have to go from database software to kernel OS and networking stack on the database server, across the wire to the storage server, into storage server software, and then across to PMEM, and then reverse that to get that block back. The database software can go directly to persistent memory in the storage tier and say, give me that block. And that's exactly what it does. And that allows us to bring the read latency from around 200 microseconds to less than 19, you know, around 19 is, you know, is the typical experience you will see of this particular uh, type of operation. So that path then becomes a lot faster because the database server is talking to the network card, which understands where 
data is stored in the persistent memory cache line to then return that directly back to the database server with no intervention from the um, operating system on either server, no in, uh, intervention from the storage server software. It is all done effectively as if, as if that memory was resident inside the database server itself. And that leads us to being able to provide features like the persistent memory data accelerator. So it's 19 microsecond read latency, which is 10 times as we just saw, 10 times better than previous generations of X data without persistent memory. But it also means that because we have this shared pool of memory across you know, a, a large number of storage servers, we can drive IO to some phenomenal rates. So comparing ourselves to ourselves, uh, as Gavin did on uh, the session yesterday, between X8M and X9M, we've improved uh, the, the number of IOs we can do per second from uh, 16 and a half million IOPS to 27.6 million read IOPS in one generation. You know, truly staggering figures. And I don't know of any OLTP style application that wouldn't benefit from having um, you know, the ability to do more IO faster. Uh, we've already talked about latency, so I won't go in, into that any, uh, any further, but I will talk very briefly about um, both the tiering and, and the shared nature, which I've mentioned a few times in passing. Uh, but really what, I'm, uh, what I wanna uh, boil that down to is the protection mechanisms we build into this. So because it's tiered and shared across all databases, we're moving data from disk to flash into persistent memory and then back down to flash and into persistent memory based on the workload. We also need to make sure that that information is protected and useful across multiple storage servers at the same time for both planned and unplanned downtime. So we mirror each of the persistent, each piece of memory in the persistent memory dims across multiple servers simultaneously. So that if there is fa a, a failure or if there is planned maintenance, performance doesn't suffer because only one of those persistent memory dims has the information you're looking for. What about log writes? Log writes are exactly the same proposition, something that uh, ultimately you know, drives, uh, you know, has a large hand in driving the overall performance of a database application. So anything that can be done to improve, uh, improve the latency, and by that I mean reduce the latency, allow us to do more log writes faster, uh, is going to provide an acceleration to the overall platform architecture and the database application performance over that. So let's just look at the way that log writes work before we introduce persistent memory. So the database server sends uh, log write information, so the, the, uh, the redo vector, to the storage server. And it's simultaneously asking the flash and the disk to persist that information down onto one of those storage mechanisms because they are persistent in nature. And whichever one is able to send the acknowledgement back first, whether that's flash or whether that's, uh, whether that's a hard drive, then sends the acknowledgement back to the database server that that work has been done. But both of those technologies are slow in comparison to memory technologies. Flash being faster than disk, but you know, they're both, uh, both slower than, uh, than, than memory technologies. So because we have persistent memory inside the storage servers, and because it's persistent, we have a location that we can write to directly from the database servers using RDMA. So the persistent memory commit accelerator is the first place that we're going to put that redo vector inside the storage platform. And because we know persistent memory is persistent and because we are uh, avoiding all of that uh, extra latency or, or the, um, the context switching and the network you know, traversal and, and all of those things we talked about a few slides ago, we're able to get eight times faster log writes by going directly to persistent memory and then asynchronously, as this next diagram shows, flushing that log vector, that uh, the log buffer that's in uh, persistent memory down onto flash and down onto disk. So we're still persistent, you know, down onto one of those storage mechanisms or the, one of those storage media because it's crucial that we do so. But that, that, uh, that introduction of persistent memory and the use of RDMA the database's ability to know where that persistent memory is in that shared storage tier allows us to improve uh, OLTP performance significantly in high transactional throughput environments. 
So these are the kinds of technologies that are very hard to introduce in traditional architectures because they just become a hardware technology that you're placing in there. You have to make, uh, you have to have an application that is aware of its entire surroundings, its entire ecosystem. And that's what RDMA and persistent memory and the Oracle Exadata ecosystem allow us to do on your behalf is build a platform that brings all of these technologies together, not just as the fastest technology in their particular category, but to serve a purpose, to serve an application Oracle database to allow you to build applications that can leverage all of that technology to the full, uh, to its fullest rather. So just to recap a little bit, uh, some of the benefits of uh, persistent memory and short storage, uh, it's efficient. You know, we are automatically caching information into the persistent memory. Um, this is the same kind of technology or the same algorithms in, uh, brought to bear to cache information in the, uh, in the flash cache that you are hopefully all very familiar with. It's adaptive by nature. You know, we are moving information between these different tiers inside the storage in a dynamic way uh, so that we always have the most useful information in flash and in persistent memory. It's accessible only using the database. So it's, it's using the mode of the persistent memory that requires application understanding. Uh, so you know, having this information just written to persistent memory is completely useless unless you understand how to read that information. And that's, uh, that's what the security uh, line is saying there. You don't have to turn this on. When you take delivery of a new Exadata uh, and go through that, original, that initial deployment, all the persistent memory constructs are built for you, both the persistent memory data accelerator and the persistent memory commit accelerator. And it's about a 95 to 5% split between the two. We don't need very much um, persistent memory for the commit accelerator. We obviously want lots of memory available for the data accelerator. Uh, and we do that automatically for you. I've already talked about resiliency in RDMA or that low latency, um, but they are crucial. You know, having that, uh, having that data mirrored across multiple servers simultaneously means that we are ultimately uh, protecting that information, but also protecting performance. If you have planned or unplanned maintenance, unplanned maintenance being a failure of some sort, that data is already on you know, at least two more DIMMs in different servers so the performance doesn't suffer when you know, a read has to come from a different location instead. And RDMA, like we said before, allows us to avoid uh, all of those contexts, which is going directly from the database server to persistent memory uh, for those reads and write uh, operations. So it enables, you know, potentially enables a, uh, you know, a large number of um, uh, applications to have much higher performance than they have today, but potentially also enables a new class of applications going forward as well. And who knows what, the, uh, what will uh, be brought to bear over time in that regard. So just uh, as we get close to the end of the session, we'll just recap a little bit around uh, the other features of Exadata, just in case you aren't as familiar with uh, some of these features. Um, I've talked a lot about OLTP, but I, I don't want to let it um, uh, let analytics or data warehouse style workloads or mixed workloads go unmentioned. So one of the core features of Exadata, and we did talk about this a little bit at the start of the call, but we didn't talk about it in explicit detail, um, is the ability to send work to the storage servers rather than send the data to the database servers, most of which is going to be you know, discarded and not used. So the different combinations of uh, features like smart scan or SQL offload, this is moving SQL from database server down to the storage server to do that projection and filtering using the tiered flash cache and our persistent memory as well. Uh, a feature called storage indexes, which I didn't talk about in any detail at all during this session, but is designed to avoid work. It allows queries to be lazy um, by, telling, by the database, sorry, by the storage server, knowing exactly what blocks to read and which ones not to read based on the query that's coming into that platform. Uh, hybrid column compression, one of the earliest features of Exadata, allowing us to get anywhere between 10 and 20 times compression, possibly even more depending on the data, but it allows you know, huge storage savings as well as performance benefits um, uh, for very large data warehouse style environments. And for customers using our in-memory technology, having that flash capacity inside the storage servers allows us to increase the overall 
addressability of the columnarized format of data that in-memory brings to the Oracle database to include not just memory inside the story, sorry, inside the database servers, but also use flash as an extension of that memory inside the storage servers, uh, increasing the overall uh, addressability of that, uh, of that use case uh, for customers that are, that are using the in-memory technologies. OLTP talked a lot about this in terms of latency and so forth, but um, the technologies that drive OLTP or, or you know, uh, transactional workloads are really the ones we've, we've talked about in a fair bit of detail. You know, high-speed network, in particular, uh, features like RDMA, anything that removes overhead and latency from the operating system and the network uh, and, uh, and you know, any other piece of software, all those context switches, improves overall throughput and overall performance of old TP applications because we're doing less work in code. We're, we're moving more of that, um, that interaction, moving blocks from one rack node to the other. Um, to a much lower level in the architecture because we understand that entire architecture in totality and have um, modified and, and optimized the Oracle database to make use of that. Some good key examples, and I, I kind of talk about these in passing um, uh, a couple of times already, but uh, messaging in a rack environment. Real application clusters needs to move data from one instance to another on a very regular basis. You know, transaction comes in on node one, the master of that data is on node two, that data has to be copied across to node one so that it can then be manipulated and then sent back to, uh, to from whence it came. Using RDMA, instead of all of the network and operating system context switching and so forth that we talked about earlier on, RDMA is able to push and pull that data from one database server to another without all of that extra interaction. That improves into message, uh, sorry, into node messaging um, up to three times faster. Uh, uh, block transfers are, you know, then benefit from that as well, as do commit, um, uh, keeping a record of commit uh, state between different nodes uh, for media recovery and other, uh, and other purposes. And we already talked about uh, instant uh, failure detection and the, uh, the need to detect failed or sick componentry so that it can be removed from a cluster and reintroduced safely so the entire uh, stability of, uh, of a database environment is not compromised. Because most uh, environments have more than just analytics, they have more than just OLTP, they have a combination of these two. Oftentimes applications do a, uh, a balance of the two in conjunction with each other. We've done a lot of work by virtue of all these performance features and security features to make this also the best consolidation platform. Because we can do more work with less hardware, we're able to bring multiple workloads on uh, to the same platform, whether they are complementary in nature, you know, analytics that runs overnight versus OLTP that runs during the day. Or I might bring both of these on together that have relatively high levels of usage at all times, but I'm able to control the resources to ensure that not just you know, uh, you know, read IO and so forth is being managed at the storage server, but as we saw before, Network messaging is also prioritized to make sure that OLTP latency sensitive operations, uh, log switching, cache fusion blocks uh, being you know, moved between, uh, between servers and so forth, do not get overwhelmed or impacted by analytic style or batch style IO requirements that you know, do a lot of work, but are not, uh, that are not latency sensitive. So there's a lot of work being done in that space with Xdata over the, over the intervening 15 years. Um, and the same with separation. So security is, uh, you know, is, is paramount uh, in anything that we do at Oracle. So being able to ensure that not just the resources are managed uh, appropriately, but also that security is, uh, is managed appropriately between different, uh, different workloads, whether that's different pools of database administrators operating on different uh, different databases and different applications, but also um, the way the machine is managed and patched. All of these are brought together uh, to make sure that it is the most secure environment you can run Oracle database on as well. For most platforms or most organizations, when we're consolidating, uh, that brings us to the use of things like uh, virtualization. And one of the key you know, enhancements in, uh, in Exadata is very much the ability to use, or sorry, very much, is the ability for us to use KVM as a virtualization platform now. 
In previous generations, we used Oracle Virtual Machine, which was based on Xen. Uh, KVM being a native, uh, a native environment, uh, virtualization environment inside Linux, means that we can leverage more of the resources inside the database servers. And that allows us in particular to, again, to bring more workload together, but allows us to use memory specifically inside the database servers um, to a much greater extent than we were able to in previous generations. So I mentioned right at the top of the call, we can ship up to two terabytes of storage in X9M database servers. Um, in previous generations, we would have been capped at around 720 gig for virtualized platforms, both in terms of physical memory and the virtual memory allocated to that. KVM allows us to go well and truly beyond that uh, cap and you know, effectively uh, use all of the memory that's available minus a little bit of overhead for the hypervisor. But it also removes, as this graphic shows, uh, a lot of the internal um, complications that come along with Zen, extra software, device drivers, and so on and so forth. KVM is a native, uh, native platform to the architecture uh, going forward. So just before I wrap up, uh, I just want to talk about some of the other ways that you can get access to Exadata. I talked very briefly about uh, this at the top of the call, but Exadata is core to Oracle strategy. It is something that we are uh, completely invested in, not just for on-premises deployments, but hopefully you're all aware about cloud customer offerings, so bringing Exadata as a cloud offering. Oracle owner manage the hardware infrastructure on your behalf, but we do so in your data center, and you control the, uh, the virtualized platform above that and the databases, or as a true public cloud offering, whether that's the Exadata cloud service or the autonomous platform, both shared and dedicated. They're all, these are all different ways of accessing Exadata technology, depending on where you are in your cloud journey, depending on what your requirements are around uh, security. Um, you know, you're, you may be in a highly regulated environment and public cloud is something that is not, uh, you know, is not used heavily or widely in, in that industry. Uh, or maybe regulated by, uh, you know, by government entities and so forth. So depending on where you are on that journey, depending on your uh, cost model, depending on how you want to do management overall, depending on how much work you want to give us instead of having to do it yourself, so you can get on and do things that uh, really are truly value add to your organization. There is a way of consuming Exadata uh, in, any, um, in any of these models. And just to summarize how that uh, kind of uh, plan, uh, plays out, um, the further you get to public cloud, or the closer you get to public cloud, true public cloud, the more Oracle does on your behalf. Now you can see here on the left-hand side, you know, it's your machine, it's in your data center, it's entirely managed by you or you know, a partner of your choosing. It's, it's your responsibility. Hybrid cloud or the cloud at customer model, Oracle is doing more of that work. We manage the infrastructure, the physical infrastructure. Uh, we manage all of the hardware operations and so forth. What we don't manage and don't control is what happens inside the database. That is entirely up to you. And public cloud is the same, except instead of it being your data center, where you then have those data center related costs, it's in our data centers instead. So now we're taking more responsibility for the overall uh, deployment of that. But again, you still own and operate the database and everything that runs inside that. We're just managing more of the ecosystem underneath that so that you don't have to. And I mentioned this right at the very start of the call, um, our commitment to Exadata is only increasing over time. Uh, it is not reducing, we run all of our SaaS applications on this, you know, Fusion Apps, uh, ERP, HCM, and so on and so forth. Autonomous, I've mentioned a few times now, uh, they all run exclusively on, uh, on Exadata in our, uh, in our cloud environments, as well as our cloud at customer offering uh, for the dedicated autonomous cloud at customer. And that allows us to bring all the benefits of Exadata to the cloud rather than having uh, asking customers to recreate or rewrite applications or find new uh, novel ways of you know, trying to emulate uh, or, or hoping that they can come up with some way of producing a, uh, a high performance environment that also has all of the other characteristics, availability, scalability, uh, manageability. Um, we feel that these are you know, attributes of the platform that really can't be recreated unless you recreate the entire stack. And we have that stack that we can recreate inside Oracle Cloud and make it as a, uh, a very easy consumption point. 
for those that are interested, just a um, just a, a quick look back on where we've come from, uh, all the way back in 2008 with our version one uh, offering, all the way through to X9M. I'm not going to belabor any of these points here. The the figures you know do speak for themselves, but this really hopefully um, demonstrates the relentless pursuit of performance that I've mentioned a few times now. Um, just the staggering, uh, you know, um, uh, IO rates that I mentioned earlier on, 27.6 million read IOPS per second. What I didn't mention in regards to analytics was we've broken the one terabyte per second scan rate. Um, 560 was our previous uh, benchmark in the X8M platform in X9M. Uh, it's about an 87% improvement, uh, if I remember the, the maths correctly. Um, so it's a, it's a staggering increase in performance just in one generation by making use of more and more of this technology and architecting and optimizing the database to enable uh, those kind of uh, staggering numbers to, uh, to float to the top. And finally, just before I uh, let you all go and say thank you for your time, I just want to remind you that because we run Exadata in all of our cloud offerings, both underneath the SaaS uh, offerings I talked about, also underneath our autonomous platform, Exadata Cloud Service, our cloud at customer, and because we have uh, you know, thousands of these machines deployed globally over the last 15 years, tens of thousands of these machines um, you know, deployed globally, we have a massive community of machines out there in the world that we are constantly getting best practice information about and operational best practice information about to continually evolve the platform to make it better and better. As opposed to, as I was uh, talking about very early on in the piece, you know, individuals or small teams of people building platforms that are bespoke to their environment, but that are unique in the entire world and cannot be replicated. No one vendor has a view of what is going on top to bottom because there are multiple vendors involved. So the community effect of a machine like Exadata uh, is something not to be uh, not to be discounted or, or misremembered. Anyway, with that, I'm going to say thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate uh, both your uh, attention today in this particular session, but also yesterday uh, in our other session. Um, please reach out, as I said before, um, uh, very approachable on, uh, on Twitter and on LinkedIn. I'll just put those back up very briefly so you can see where you can get access to us. And please keep an eye on the blog. Um, we're going to keep putting out as much uh, useful information as we can on the blog uh, as it comes to hand. Um, so hopefully we can all keep, uh, keep learning uh, and keeping abreast of what's going on with these technologies. And with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. And thank you very much to Francisco uh, for arranging all of this. And I uh, uh, hope you have a excellent rest of the conference. Thank you. CloudDB, shaping your new normal.